Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Meet the Joint, me, part of the National Hemophilia Foundation's Make Your Move Physical Therapy webinar series. This new series is supported by a cooperative agreement from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Our presenter this evening is Luke Smith. Luke T.L. Smith, PT, BPT, CEAS, CSCS is a physical therapist, therapist at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He has worked with Jefferson's Hemophilia Treatment Center, Cardiza Foundation, for hematologic research for seven years. Luke was a part of the NHF's Physical Therapy Working Group and is currently the physical therapist representative for the Mid-Atlantic Region 3 Regional Executive Committee. Welcome, Luke Smith. Thank you. And you're very welcome. Our program tonight will conclude with a question and answer segment. There will also be an evaluation after the presentation for participants to complete. Your valuable input will help us better define programs for the future. To ask a question, go to the area in the far lower left of your webinar screen and type your question into the field just to the left of the send button which is located in the pod area labeled chat. Click the send button when you have finished typing your question. However, please note that your question will be addressed during the question and answer session at the end of the presentation. The PowerPoint presentation will be available as a handout. However, a recording of this webinar will be available shortly on the National Hemophilia Foundation website, www hemophilia.org. For more information, be sure to visit www.stepsforliving.hemophilia.org. Without further ado, I will turn things over to you, Luke. All right. Th thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, present this information uh, to you all. Uh, I'd like to thank the National Hemophilia Foundation for allowing me to uh, present this evening. And uh, we'll begin by talking about uh, the lower extremity and specifically the, the knee. So we have a few objectives that uh, we will look to cover uh, this evening. Um, trying to get an understanding of, you know, the basic anatomy of the knee joint and the, the various functions of the knee and how it uh, interacts with the lower extremity or the leg, as we like to call it. Um, from there, you know, understanding um, the impact that um, can happen when you have a bleed and then just recognizing some of those signs and symptoms. And then, um, you know, learning about uh, various ways to, to treat and recover uh, from a joint bleed. And uh, as a physical therapist, uh, we don't own all the exercises in the world, but uh, certainly some of us think we know a bunch. Uh, so. Hopefully, we can go over a few exercises and, and give you guys some ideas in terms of uh, things that you can do to, to help with the recovery. So we'll start with uh, just some basic anatomy. And if you can see here in the, the picture, I have a schematic of a, of a knee. And um, when, when you think of the knee, I like to think of the knee as almost like a, a railroad track with a train, right? And so you have if you want to think of the, the femur or this big long bone here, and that interacts with what we call the tibia, which is sitting in here. And there's also a smaller bone called the fibula. All right? So you have the femur, the tibia, and the fibula. Right? In the middle of all that, you have what we call the patella or the kneecap. And so if you think of an emotion that really happens at the knee joint, it's really a we call flexion or bending and extension, um, which is straightening out the knee, which it's right now the, the knee's in an extended position in this picture. Uh, so if you can think of the interaction there as kind of like this railroad track and how everything needs to be congruent, so to speak, for, for movements. Now, I am simplifying it a little bit in terms of the motions. Uh, at the knee joint, there is some rotational components, but for all intents and purposes, the knee bends, 
and the knee strains, right? Uh, as you can see in the picture, there's a lot of different, um, you know, obviously there's skin, but, you know, if you, you remove skin, there's, there's muscles, there's tendons, there's, there's ligaments. And I think it's important to kind of just point out uh, some of the structures that you could just look at your own knee, right? And I think uh, that the point of showing you this picture and the point of kind of highlighting some areas is just, you know, having an understanding of what your joints look like uh, is important so that when there is a problem, uh, you can really uh, pick it out and, and point it out um, really rapidly. So quadricep, big muscle here, uh, quadricep meaning four. So there's four various muscles that kind of blend into this big, massive unit that helps you extend your leg. Uh, the tendons kind of blend past the, the kneecap and then insert into this region right over here, which is, you know, your patella tendon coming into this part of the tibia. Uh, there's another portion here that I didn't really highlight pretty soon, but I'm kind of going over with the pointer. And this is a, a band of tissue that inserts in this region. And, you know, it, it's called the IT band, if you ever heard of, of that structure. And that can provide some support and some uh, stability at times. Um, pointing out here, you can see the joint line. And so kind of in the mid portion of the kneecap is kind of where the middle part of your joint it. So the division of your femur and your tibia, you have that middle part, which is kind of like your joint line, right? So where things, the structures kind of meet. And I think that's kind of an important thing to think about. So if you are, you know, touching or palpating your knee joint right now as we as we speak, like I am, <laughs> um, you can kind of feel if your knee's in a bent position, how there's like a, a um, it kind of changes in terms of you can feel kind of a bony prominence and then all of a sudden there's maybe a little space and there's another bony prominence potentially. Uh, we have kind of in this region we have the, the I guess we call them the calf muscles but you can also call them the gastroc and soleus complex in the, in the back portion of this picture and the front you have um, you know part of the tibialis anterior and, and some other of the shin, shin bone muscles. So all these collective muscles really um, help with movement, help with stability. Um, and in the back, there's the hamstring, which is directly behind uh, the quadricep here. So if we were to remove, uh, you know, skin, muscle, joint, now we're getting in just the kind of a bony architecture. So as you, as you see that I mentioned before, we have, um, the femur coming into the tibia and the fibula, right? That middle part of the joint line is kind of where things kind of bend and, and straighten. So that's where the interaction of the joint happens, right? Uh, what's important to kind of point out is in the middle of this joint line, we have what we call a meniscus. And I like to keep things simple, and, and maybe I like to think of things in a simple manner. So the way I like to think of the meniscus is almost like a sponge that has maybe some water in it. And if you were to have a sponge on the ground or have a sponge in some type of a bucket, and you took some kind of like rolling ball and kind of rolled over that sponge, as the sponge um, compresses, you know, some of the fluid will come out and some of the... Um, properties will return. So think of the meniscus as almost like this shock absorber, right? It's, it's helping kind of take on some of the forces that are translated up and down the chain of your, your big leg, right? Uh, on the side here, you can see that we have some structures to assist with um, just some stability, right? So we have multiple ligaments. Uh, you know, to simplify it, we have ligaments that are on the side of our knee, we have ligaments that are in the inside of our knee, and the big ligaments that are in the inside of our knee are, are ones I think most people have heard of through maybe athletics or, or, or talks is, is the cruciate ligaments. And why are they called the cruciate ligaments? Well, if you can kind of see, they do this kind of crisscrossing uh, type of pattern. And basically, those ligaments are very important for the stability of your knee. So, you know, without those ligaments present, uh, you could have a lot of extra motion that 
uh, sometimes the body is not able to deal with. And if you think of what I just mentioned before with uh, the train tracks, anytime that you have um, lack of movement or muscles that maybe are irritated or a joint bleed or some type of form of changes, you could have um, a problem with the train tracks not being congruent. And if the train track's not congruent, then you're going to get wear and tear in various parts of the knee that could uh, potentially irritate and create uh, a further problem. So what, what does the leg do, right? Um, you know, the leg interacts in, in a big form fashion, and um, everything is, is pretty much connected in a sense. And, and I'm kind of simplifying that to an extent, but your, your ankle hits the ground, and, and your knee has to take some form of movement. Your hip has to take some form of movement. Your, your pelvis, your trunk. So all, all that has to happen in a... In a nice coordinated fashion where you're accepting forces and you're transmitting forces in order to go from maybe point A to point B or to, you know, go from a sitting to standing position um, to go up and down a step. And there has to be a coordinated fashion of stability but yet mobility. So I guess we have a little bit of a saying where um, you know, structures that are more proximal, you can appreciate that, need to be stable so that you can have some movement in a distal position, right? So if, you know, I know we're talking about the knee, but I'm just going to say if I had to move my arm or my, and I had to reach on top of a shelf, um, my trunk and the, the base of my arm have to be stable forces so that I can actually move my extremity in my hand to reach up to the shelf. And it's no different in the, the lower extremity, right? So as you're moving your ankle, as you're moving your knee, you're going to have to have some activation in the, the trunk and, and the core, and we'll talk about how, why that's important um, a little bit later. And when we think of uh, walking or gait, as we like to talk about in the therapy world, um, we can break it down into, keep it simplistic, um, we have time spent on the ground or stance phase, and we have time spent uh, not on the ground or swing phase. And if you can see from the graph here, um, we spend more time on the ground than we do with our leg in a swinging position. And we uh, think of walking or the walking cycle in the sense of if my heel, and in this picture you can see it's the right heel. Now let's just call it the right. I think it's the right. Uh, heel striking the ground. When that heel returns to the ground, that is one uh, cycle, right? Uh, and so a lot of things uh, happen within a walking cycle. And you need certain amounts of movement. You need certain amounts of motion. Uh, for things to happen smoothly. And if you think back to what I talked about, the knee being this railroad track, simplifying things, I guess, and uh, things having to be congruent, if you're missing certain amounts of motion or certain muscles are uh, weak, uh, if you're missing motion in other regions of your body, uh, you know, if the leg is a uh, different lengths, uh, there could be problems with how you interact with this cycle. And so uh, taking a look at this next slide here, it kind of just brings it a little bit more to, to light. If we take a look at the first part, and we're just kind of looking more at a stance phase here, um, here you can see that the individual is about to strike down into that position, what we call initial contact. And what I want you to appreciate is that if you look at the knee, it's pretty much in a straight position, right? So we would call that zero degrees of extension. So you're, you're pretty much extended all the way. So if you can appreciate, if you are missing um, some degrees of motion, how already um, your, your walking can be affected, right? It's something as simple as now I can't straighten my knee all the way out. Now when I'm hitting the ground, um, things are interacting differently and that 
forces are being shot in different ways in my body that, um, you know, you could argue maybe aren't supposed to happen that way. And so that's really important. I guess I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but it's really important when you have some type of uh, issue with a, a joint, whether it's a bleed or, or um, some type of injury, you want to really make sure that uh, preserving your range of motion is, uh, you know, something to consider. Now, it's not the only thing to consider. Uh, you really also want to think about, you know, strength and and. and and, and those type of things, um, because if you have muscles that are, you know, in a weak state of uh, mind or, or phase, um, it can impact how you take your steps, right? So if, if you see going along through this um, gait pattern, you know, in terms of walking, the knee needs about maybe at the most maybe 60 degrees of kind of a bend, right? So in order to kind of swing my leg up, uh, I need to at least bend it to about 60 degrees. So I don't have to get to a right angle uh, for a whole completed cycle. But there are certain things that need to happen at the ankle, right? And a lot of times uh, people with um, a bleeding disorder tend to have problems not at just one joint. Sometimes it's multiple joints, right? And so, you know, at least in, in the clinic sometimes I see um, there, there could be a, a problem with the knee. But the problem really started because there was a problem with the ankle. You know, the, the, you weren't able to um, get your ankle into a certain position or movement. And because of that, now you are uh, changing how you're stepping on the ground. And as a result of that, uh, you're having uh, difficulty with um, control. And uh, next thing you know, there's different forces that are going through the joint. And that could create kind of... those things. This, this picture here, this slide, um, the, the, the point of this is just kind of talking about how the leg is almost like a standing position moving through the walking cycle or your leg's actually moving. It's, 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 like, it's moving like a pendulum. And if it's in the standing position, you know, it's, it's a kind of like a reversed pendulum or inverted pendulum, right, where the, the pelvis part is, is kind of moving in that direction. And if you, your leg's in the, the air, then it's, it's really kind of the opposite. It's like the limb is moving kind of in the, in, the, in the pendulum. So just thinking how, if you can kind of see on the picture how it's, it's moving forward, but yet there's some movement up and down, and it's not this just smooth pattern. There's some flow and some give to how we walk. And, uh, you know, as a, as a therapist, I guess I, I tend to, to watch people walk uh, more than I care to admit, and everybody walks uh, differently, right? So wh what is normal? I guess normal is there's, there's some certain things that need to happen in certain patterns, but um, everybody has kind of a a unique way of moving. So what happens with, with the bleed, right? Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, in terms of the signs and symptoms, uh, some of you probably attending this uh, are, are very familiar with, you know, some of the things that uh, happen with a bleed, um, you know, the, the loss of motion, the, the pain, uh, that kind of tingling feeling, the, the heat, um, you know, whether it was a spontaneous occurrence or whether you, you, you know, banged your knee invertedly or just kind of fell down and next thing you know, um, you know, it starts to uh, go through a cascade that's uh, potentially unpleasant. As you can see in the picture here, and I guess that's going back to the first slide where I was talking about it's nice to know kind of the, what your knee kind of looks like, right? And I would make the argument, not that I'm a person that argues, uh, that it's nice to know that about various other joints too, so that if something were to happen, you can kind of tease out, you know, um, in detail, wow, you know, it, I, I used to be able to feel this part of my knee, but now it, it, you know, feels a little different and it looks a little different. 
right? So in the picture here, you can really see the, the swelling and the puffiness and, and, and how this is starting to you know, become something that uh, is uh, not too desirable um, and potentially impacting how this person moves um, and affecting their day-to-day -day, uh, routine. So when you have, um, you know, a bleed, and I, I think some of this might be um, quite obvious, um, but yeah, it, it, it's going to limit, you know, how you interact. Um, you know, if you're in school, you know, you could end up missing a lot of days of school, um, and that can make an impact on, you know, just how you feel overall. Um, impacts on, you know, social. Uh, you know, in terms of the workforce, you, you know, missing a lot of days at work, and you know, that can put a lot of pressure on not only you but the, the employer, and, and you know, it be becomes a, a very hard um, situation in that sense. You have uh, instances where uh, now just performing a, you know, a routine of, of your daily living activities uh, is a challenge. You know, just getting clothes on and, and walking or you know, bathing tasks that, you know, some, you know, people um, unfortunately probably just take uh, for granted um, can be a, a detriment and a very um, challenging struggle, right? So, you know, one of the things that I think is important and, you know, I, I think uh, the HTCs, uh, um, I think, do a pretty decent job with this. And, and, you know, I think so if, if you can, touching base with your HTC to make sure that you're on the proper dosage of, of factor replacement and, you know, uh, trying to manage if you, if you do have an inhibitor, uh, those type of situations. I think, uh, you know, the HTCs are um, probably more equipped uh, to try to deal with some of those um, challenging situations. Um, but, you know, the, the big thing is also when you have a, a bleed is you, you really want to limit the occurrence for it to get worse, right? And so, as I just mentioned, you know, thinking about the knee and thinking about the railroad track, if I have a bleed, if I continue to put a lot of weight through my leg, I can potentially drive forces through my knee. And if I drive forces through my knee, I can continue to stir the problem. And so usually the recommendation is to try to limit how much you're weight-bearing. And, and that's why we say it, right? Well, one of the reasons why we say it. So whether you're using some form of an assistive device, and, uh, you know, I always get into, um, I guess, discussions with people regarding assistive devices because, you know, sometimes it's not a desirable thing, right? Um, you know, who wants to use crutches? Who wants to use a cane? Who wants to uh, be in a wheelchair? Um, and uh, it's a, it's a challenge, um, but, you know, trying to limit the amount of weight that is uh, putting through the joint is, uh, can be a critical uh, moment for sure. And, and that being said, that goes kind of hand in hand with, um, you know, rest and, you know, applying some compression and, and trying to elevate it so that you can calm basically the situation down, right? You're trying to limit uh, how out of hand something gets. Right, and uh, I think that's that's the first line of of anything is is making sure you have you know proper uh, factor on board and making sure that you're limiting the amount of irritation that you could potentially um, do to the joint. So when you're thinking about uh, treatment, at least when as a physical therapist, when we're thinking about uh, treatment of the knee. Um, you know, the range of motion or flexibility is, is, is key. As I mentioned before, uh, if you saw in the picture um, earlier, when you're dealing with the walking cycle, a, a person needs a certain amount of motion. And so if you're missing certain degrees of movement, and it could be subtle, that now changes how everything up the chain and down the chain interacts, right? And so when you have a joint bleed that, and reoccurring joint bleeds, um, and as things tend to, you know, stir, uh, you have the potential to, to lose some motion. And, you know, a lot of people in, in our clinic, um, 
have those situations, and it's a, it's a challenge because now we have uh, deviations to the motion and to the gait cycle and uh, trying to, you know, accommodate and, or trying to, you know, strengthen certain muscles so that we prevent uh, further um, problems is, is a challenge, right? But so that's, that's the importance of, of trying to work on uh, some range of motion. And so for the knee, and I, I would make the statement that it's not just if you have a problem with your knee, it's not just your knee. You have to think of other joints. Um, you know, things are, and we can make arguments about this, but things are somewhat connected, right? There's, there's regions that need to depend on each other uh, to do something. You know, if I'm doing something at my knee, chances are, other joints might be doing something also, right? My ankle, my, my hip. If I'm trying to go from a sitting to standing position, I need cooperation from multiple segments of my body to create that experience. And so that's why some of the motion is very important when we think of treatment. Uh, strength, you need a decent amount of strength to provide the support and the stability and the movement of, of a structure. And so we talked about earlier how you need um, things proximally uh, to activate and be stable in order to create some type of movement on a distal uh, limb. And so the core is very important. And uh, you know, making sure that you're paying attention to those muscles, uh, the core, and when I mean core, I guess I'm talking about your trunk region, um, you know, uh, I guess some people will just say abs, but it's it's more than just that. And, and so strengthening those properties are very important um, for any type of injury, especially uh, injury at the knee. Uh, the lower extremity overall, so going into your hips, uh, specifically areas of your glutes, uh, are very important and very powerful muscles that we uh, use on a daily basis to do a lot of different activities. Just, you know, a basic one is just going from a sitting to standing position. Your your glutes are, are very active in that sense. And, and so not having proper activation um, in those muscles can really uh, be a detriment. Uh, in, in the walking cycle, somebody who has weak um, glute muscles won't take a big step, and their, their, their steps will be a lot shorter because they won't be able to handle some of the forces that are getting drive, driven up the chain. And so you could see somebody who, you know, doesn't really have a whole lot of strength um, in the glute region taking really these little short steps. And, you know, the quadriceps that we talked about and the hamstring, as we showed in the uh, portion of the anatomy review, uh, very big muscles that, you know, are basically located on that femur bone and uh, really important for allowing you to bend and straighten out your knee. So if those muscles are weak, just the activity of um, strengthening or moving your knee is going to be a problem. So when you're thinking about range of motion, you're thinking about flexibility, you're thinking about stretching, uh, the, the, the ideal number that we talk about is, is 30 seconds. You know, being able to hold some form of a stretch for 30 seconds seems to be um, the, the ideal. Now, what I always like to say is that there's, there's the science and then there's the art. And, uh, and the, the science, we know certain numbers tell us, all right, we got to stretch for 30 seconds or we have to, you know, if we're looking to, to strengthen certain things or uh, look at things from an endurance perspective, you know, we, we might use higher reps, we might use lower reps and, 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 you know, that's all well and good. But I guess where the art comes into play and I think where people need to touch base with, um, you know, healthcare providers or, you know, if you're seeing a trainer, I always like to say, when, you know, when people come into my, uh, the clinic that, you know, we're at, and, if, and they're working with some type of a trainer, I like to talk to the trainers just to make sure that we're all talking the same lingo. Um, but, you know, there's, there's an art. Everybody's individual. And, uh, you know, what works for, 
you know, person A might not work for person B, even though you might have the same um, injury or you might have the same, you know, joint bleed. It might be the same mechanism, but um, everybody's individual. So that's where, you know, I think there's some wiggle room and in, in, in touching base with people so that, you know, you're not doing something that could be incorrect um, and um, is, is an important thing to do. So, yes, 30 seconds, you know, you know, I always say, you know, two or three times, uh, and just you want, you want to feel kind of that light pulling sensation, uh, nothing going into pain, especially when you're recovering from uh, bleed. When you're thinking about um, strengthening, uh, we tend to say that you want to use uh, lighter resistance. You don't want to go into these powerful, explosive um, maneuvers. Uh, you really want to use, uh, whether you're using your, your body weight or you're using a very light type of resistance, like light um, free weights or light uh, resistance bands or um, a cable system that's on the you know, almost on the lowest uh, uh, setting, depending on you know what your baseline is, and, and you want to think more higher repetition. Um, you never want to forget about strengthening you know above and below different areas. So you know when I'm thinking of the knee and I'm recovering from um, a, a bleed, I really want to pay attention to you know what's happening above and below my my knee. Uh, and so we talked about, you know, making sure that your core is, 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 is being addressed, making sure that your, your hips uh, and those muscles are being addressed. And you don't want to forget about, you know, the lower half, so like the calf region, right? So it's above and below and really taking care of the group because there's, uh, it all kind of works together. So what kind of things can we do? What, uh, what kind of stretches are out there and, and what, what, uh, what are some options, right? So in terms of range of motion, in terms of stretches, you know, when you think of the lower half of your body, there's, there's so many different things that you can do. Um, you can do stretching in a standing position depending on your uh, comfort, your, your abilities. Um, you can do some of those stretches to, to get the knees bending in a seated position. You can also do them in a lying down position. You can just do basic movements up and down at the ankles uh, to, to get some of the flexibility in the, the back of the legs or in the front of the legs and the, the, the shin area uh, moving. Uh, so from a stretch position, you know, when you're thinking about stretching the, the lower half of your body due to, you know, the fact that you have maybe like a joint weed at the knee happening, you know, stretching the hamstring, stretching the quads, uh, stretching out the, the calf muscles, uh, you know, stretching out some of these what we call hip flexors. Uh, those, those might be some important muscles just to address just the overall movement of the leg, right? And we're talking about the knee, but we're talking about really overall movement of the leg, which uh, is going to help the knee in general. When you're thinking of strengthening exercises, as I mentioned, you know, you want to think about above and below. So um, there's so many different ways that you can target uh, some of these muscles, but these uh, exercises here are targeting um, your glute region, uh, the hip muscles, um, if you can see in the picture here is something that we call a clamshell where you take like a band. It's a, it's a great exercise for really targeting uh, what we call the, the glute med, which sometimes tends to be uh, actually deficient in a majority of people, uh, regardless of uh, bleeding disorder or not. Uh, so really strengthening this. And if you're not able to tolerate kind of a lying down position, there's other ways and positions that you can do it. And you could really do this in a seated position and just kind of opening and closing your legs. You could um, also do this on your back and opening and closing your legs. 
uh, in this sideline position, it's a little bit more of a challenge because we have um, gravity that's also creating a force. So this is probably the position that's more of the challenge to do the exercise, but you can modify it to, to different um, limitations. And you can see in these, this picture here, we're just working on, again, uh, you're, you're getting some quad work, but it's really you're getting some hip uh, motions and all these different exercises here. So we're thinking about strengthening above the joint of target, right? Uh, as I mentioned, you know, you can do different things with bands. Uh, I, I like some of those light resistance bands. Um, I think they're they're quick and they're easy, and um, you can get some of this from, uh, you know, uh, we have it in the clinic. Um, and, uh, you know, there, you can strengthen, you know, quads. You can do some things for your hamstrings. You can do kind of a modified kind of like leg press. You're really strengthening a lot of things. You can do... Um, kind of a light miniature kind of squat. Uh, so they're nice little things that you can do that uh, I think uh, you can really modify the bands to do a lot of different things. Um, some advancements from this would be, you know, let's say you're, you're starting to feel a little bit better, you can take the band and actually wrap it around uh, the legs and do some side steps or some back steps. Uh, and those are nice ways to kind of work kind of like the overall uh, muscles of the, the lower half of your body. Um, so there's a lot of different, um, I guess, uh, varial, uh, variability in terms of exercises that you can do um, to really strengthen. But the, I guess the key is you want to think about higher repetitions, not really that much resistance, and uh, just really making sure that you're uh, paying attention. And, and really, actually, you know, before you do any type of exercise, you really want to make sure that your, your levels are pretty good. So, you know, taking some factor uh, and, and treating with that before you actually do some of the exercises is, is an important thing to, to consider. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope uh, this was informative. And uh, if you have any, any questions, I would love to entertain them. All right. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question via the web presentation, select the chat pod located in the lower left corner of your screen. Then type and send your question. If you would like to ask a question live via your phone, press star 1 on your telephone keypad. I will announce each caller prior to bringing you into the conference. Please remember if you have your phone on mute, take it off mute when you are selected to ask your question. Once again, to ask a question via the web presentation, select the chat pod located in the lower left corner of your screen and then type and send your question. And to ask a, lot, a question live, press star 1 on your telephone keypad. All right, let's see. First question we have is, do you see folks that are knocked knee developing issues with their knee long term? So the question that I believe I heard is, do I see people that uh, are not need and do they develop uh, issues long term? Correct. Um, I do see, uh, I guess, people with and without uh, bleeding disorders with various, um, I guess, alignments of their knee. Um, there are people that I see that have a knock knee presentation, I guess, if you want to call it. And I see people that also have, I guess, more of a bow-legged uh, presentation. Um, and to, to be quite honest, I mean, I think it varies. Like, I, I can't say that, yes, because you have a knock knee presentation, uh, it's a guarantee to have some form of um, issue further down the line. I, I can't say that I can make that, that jump. Um, but I have seen people that have various uh, presentations like that, knock knee or bow-legged, that do have problems. But it's not always a definite. Okay. Next question. Oh, this is an interesting one. I've ridden a bicycle across America five times and logged over 100,000 miles, all on a knee joint replacement. 
that is now 18 years old. I've met some ortho doctors that discourage this level of physical activity. What are your thoughts on post-joint replacement physical activity? Well, that's <clears throat> so. What are my thoughts on post-joint uh, replacement activity? Uh, I'm, I'm that's an impressive amount of uh, mileage that you got out of your knee replacement. I will say that. Uh, um, the, the amount of years that they tend to say in terms of the, the knees isn't really that much. I think it used to be 10 to 15 years or so. It sounds like you've got some good mileage out of uh, that replacement. Uh, there is a concern for uh, a high level of activity with uh, the possible um, wear and tear of the actual uh, replaced knee. Um, so, but, uh, I mean, I, but that, that's a that's a tough question to to to, to really answer. I, I I I'm a, I'm a therapist and I, I love activity. I love movement and it's it's you know it's stuff that I encourage. But at the same time, I can see where um, the doctors or the surgeon is coming from from a perspective of wow that, that that's a lot of activity for that joint and that could potentially turn into uh, needing to have to do something about it. Okay, and the next question, does ice really help in an acute bleed? Because it's, it's more bothers my son more than helps. Uh, so, so great question. Um, does ice uh, really help or not? Um, uh, you know, I, I think there's, there's, there was, there, there's been some debate about that um, in the recent years. Uh, some people tend to still favor some ice, uh, others don't. Uh, I, I tend to favor a lot of almost compression. So if, you know, if you, I think the biggest thing, if you have uh, a bleed that's happening, the first thing is to treat it with doctor. And then from there, you know, I, I think the elevation and the compression seem to be um, what I've seen that tends to people to respond to. All right, and it looks like that may have been, oh, no, we have another question. Um, do you ever recommend heat with bleeds? I, I don't necessarily recommend uh, heat for an acute bleed. Um, usually what happens with heat is that it's actually um, uh, it's warming up some of the tissue, so it could actually, if you have some type of inflammatory process that's going on, it could actually uh, speed or, I guess, assist in that. So I tend not to recommend heat for an acute bleed. All right, next question. How, so, how soon should children begin doing strengthening exercises to help strengthen the knee joint? Uh, well, you know, children, um, you, you can begin strength training, I guess. In, in children, it tends to be more of a body weight type of strengthening. So just playing activities is actually uh, strengthening activities. But, um, you know, there are, I guess, formalized um, equipment for kids. And if they're under the guidance of, of proper uh, care, they, they can begin some form of resistance training. Uh, I, I guess the general rule of thumb is can a child, um, can they follow instructions? Can they really be disciplined and safe um, doing some of that? But usually what we say from a strength training perspective is uh, they can strength train. It's usually more body weight type of strength training. All right, and it looks like that may have been the last question. So, Luke, I will turn it back to you for any final comments. Um, uh, thank you again to the National Hemophilia Foundation for uh, you know, putting on this platform, and uh, thank you all for attending the, the webinar. Okay, it looks like actually we have two more questions that have come in. The okay. next question is, is the stationary bike useful? I, I would say a stationary bike could be useful. Um, you know, I think equipment, it depends on situations, but uh, I, I use 
in our clinic, uh, you know, uh, when somebody comes in, uh, I guess, bleeding disorder or not, I, I have gotten people on a stationary bike to, to promote some movement, uh, to promote some type of a, a warm-up. So I, I think there is some merit to it. All right. And do you have any recommendations for easing the pain resulting from arthritis in the knees and ankles? So there's, um, you know, there's, uh, I guess there's a lot of different uh, schools of thought in terms of, you know, what you can do from an arthritic standpoint. Uh, you know, with all that stiffness that happens in the morning, and 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 sometimes it seems that some gentle movements seem to be uh, beneficial. Um, you know, some people like to you know put some type of compressive sleeves on or some type of um, things like that to to assist. I've seen that some people get some benefit out of that. Uh, you know, some types of uh, exercises sometimes in a pool setting. If you have access to the water, some people seem to get some benefit out of that. I've seen uh, and heard people have success with that. Um, I think the biggest thing that I've noticed is just continuing to try to to move and 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 kind of listen to the body, uh, and, and, and not to overdo, but not underdo. If that makes any sense. All right, great. Thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, your feedback is critical to us. Um, not only in evaluating this presentation, but also in the planning of future webinars and programming. Please complete this five-minute survey appearing on your screen now by clicking on the link. For each webinar in this series that you attend, completing an evaluation will enter you for a chance to win a Fitbit at the end of the series. Attend and evaluate more than one webinar to increase your chance of winning. We'd like to thank everyone for attending, and this will conclude our program. Have a great evening.